Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Edna Andrews. I'm uh, uh, one of the faculty leaders of the Mellon Sawyer Seminar. And I'm so pleased today to welcome you to this lovely lecture, an important one for our times, The Limits and Possibilities of Linguistic Appropriation. Uh, our guest speaker today is Dr. Elaine W. Chun. She's an assistant professor, excuse, associate professor of English and linguistics at the University of South Carolina. She has uh, been awarded many grants, including a recent uh, NEH grant. She was uh, Teacher of the Year uh, through the English Department at UCS. Uh, her publications have appeared in very important journals, Language and Society, Journal of Linguistic Anthropology, Pragmatics, Language and Communication, American Speech, which used to be hosted by Duke, by the way, Applied Linguistics and Discourse in Society. Um, uh, her research examines how ideologies of language, race, racism, and gender mediate language practices in the United States. Drawing on methods of interactional analysis and ethnography, uh, Dr. Chun has primarily investigated multi-ethnic youth linguistic practices and stereotypical Asian linguistic representations in both face-to-face -face and social media context. I'd like to mention a couple of her recent things. Uh, in the Oxford Handbook of Language and Race, uh, she has a chapter coming out on language, race, and reflexivity, a view from linguistic anthropology, uh, other previous publications, uh, language and racialization, how to Drop a Name, Hybridity, Purity, and the K-pop fan. Just a few of her many interesting works. So thank you, Dr. Chen, and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Andrews. Let's see if I can get this screen to share. Does that look right? Is that okay? Great. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Andrews, and thanks everyone for inviting me to share some of my work um, today. So, what I'll be talking about today is part of a sociolinguistic project that I've been working on that examines how we, both as both linguists and as everyday actors in public space, how we think and talk about language and racism and specifically what we understand racist language to be. Um, so the data that I'm sharing today is data that, that I have, have not yet presented, but some of the broader questions that I'm asking are things that I've been thinking about for some time. So it's not uncommon today to hear phrases such as systemic racism or structural racism in mainstream media settings. Only a decade ago, we might have heard such terms being used primarily among critical race scholars or students who perhaps took a college course in critical race theory. For some, the uptake of academic discourses in popular spaces may offer a ray of hope as promising evidence that academic contexts, concepts, I'm sorry, are shaping everyday understandings of racism. But for others, the popular uptake may raise some eyebrows as we see how phrases are sometimes used in ways that fail to fully align with critical understandings of racism. So my talk today addresses the uptake of the critical concept of appropriation, theorized and critiqued by critical race scholars, and now a recognizable concept in US public space. Within linguistics, the concept has been, been explored by several scholars, but in my discussion today, I'll focus primarily on the work, the important work of Jane Hill, given her thorough critique of this practice. For Hill, white appropriations of resources from communities of color are what she calls a covertly racist practice. Despite their harmless appearance, they insidiously reproduce racial hierarchies. So in thinking about how a concept like appropriation enters popular discourses, I first introduce what language scholars specifically take to be linguistic appropriation and why they or we have understood the practice to be problematic. 
I then turned to a widely viewed 2015 video called Seven Myths about cultural appropriation debunked on MTV News, as well as about 500 of the nearly 10,000 viewer comments left in response in order to explore the extent to which everyday critiques of cultural appropriation align with assumptions held by language researchers. In order to offer this comparative perspective, I present a semiotic framework, a semiotic theory of racist signs that identifies our underlying assumptions about what makes appropriation meaningfully racist for both scholars and everyday participants of public discourse. To what extent do our everyday discussions of appropriation mirror those of language researchers? How do popular and scholarly theories of racism resonate with one another? How do they differ? Finally, what possibilities and limitations does a concept like appropriation offer in our anti-racist efforts in both academic and everyday spaces. So what I'll argue today is that while there are some important parallels between scholarly and everyday discourses about appropriation, there are also some important divergences. I'll then br briefly speak to the broader implications of these findings, specifically as scholarly concepts are used in our everyday projects of anti-racism, though I'll largely keep this latter question's final question open for discussion, and perhaps we can discuss it in the Q&A. So within sociolinguistics, the research on cross-racial linguistic borrowing took hold in the early to mid-1990s when Ben Rampton, a sociolinguist in London adopted what might be called a hopeful view of the practice. For Rampton, the practices of ethnolinguistic crossing, as he called them, weren't merely a form of creative code switching, but they actually offered evidence that multi-ethnic friendship groups were willing to challenge traditional mappings of race, ethnicity, and language. By making use of one another's ethnic varieties, these youth seemed seemingly defied traditional racial and linguistic boundaries through their crossing practices. So this is sort of the optimistic view of crossing practices. Oops. Yet across the Atlantic around this time, a very different perspective was developing among US-based linguists. When Geneva Smitherman published Black Talk, Words and Phrases from the Hood and the Amen Corner, a dictionary of African-American lexical items. In her introduction, she writes critically of crossover African-American language used by whites who in her words, don't have to pay any dues, but reap the psychological, social and economic benefits of a language and culture born out of enslavement, neo-enslavement, Jim Crow, US apartheid and 20th century hard times. Around the late 1990s, Jane Hill's seminal work on mock Spanish was published. Importantly, she described white monolingual uses of mock Spanish as involving hyper anglicizations as in el chipo or gracias or pejorative meanings as in macho or in Arnold Schwarzenegger's famous hasta la vista baby in the Terminator. In addition, she noted that monolingual white speakers profited from the use of such butchered Spanish, while brown speakers were penalized for using their authentic counterparts. She also critiqued the practice as covertly invoking stereotypes of racialized Spanish speakers. Then inspired in part by Smitherman and Hill, ethnographically oriented sociolinguists around the early 90s, 2000s use methods of discourse analysis to critique appropriations of African American English by white youth as well as Asian American youth. In these cases, non-Black speakers may have believed themselves to be performing an aspirational Blackness, but it was argued that these practices invoked problematic stereotypes, for example, by linking Black masculinity with aggression or hypersexuality. In 2008, Jane Hill published the Everyday Language of White Racism, a theoretically rigorous yet relatively accessible book on the topic. 
she devoted a significant portion of the work to detailing the semiotic process of linguistic appropriation, extending her analysis to white appropriations of not just Spanish, but also African American English and Native American languages. Across a couple chapters, she lays out several characteristics of linguistic appropriation that she argues makes it a racist practice. So first, she argues that appropriation involves the movement of linguistic resources from communities of color into white communities. In other words, appropriation is not merely about linguistic borrowing across racial boundaries, but about the transfer of symbolic resources from spaces of racial marginalization to spaces of privilege. Specifying relations of power and appropriation thus allows us to draw a distinction between appropriation on the one hand and what may, some may call acculturation or assimilation on the other, in which marginalized groups of color are viewed as adopting white middle-class practices. Second, she notes that such resources undergo a quote, transformation as they become the property of white institutions controlled and commodified by them despite the denial of the res these resources to the communities from which the resources originate. In other words, she argues that communities of color can no longer lay claim to what was once their own. They may even be penalized for using these resources in public space. This observation aligns with those made by cultural anthropologists like Sunaina Mara, who has noted the asymmetries of privilege and profit afforded to white middle-class women and South Asian Americans when South Asian symbols like bindis are offered or used in public space. As a result, speakers of color may feel pressure to switch to white, white forms as Mary Buckles has, has suggested in order to avoid being suspended from school um, or being targeted for hate crimes. Third, Hill, no Hill notes that borrowed resources undergo a reshaping of meaning and form such that they become useless to the community from whom the form was borrowed. While symbolic resources are not metaphysically the same as material objects, to Hill, appropriation is still, uh, still a form of symbolic theft, as it involves a taking of resources from the donor community um, in ways that permanently degrades its cultural value. So it's for this reason she's careful to label these forms as mock language as opposed to understanding them as authentic forms of racialized language. Finally, she notes the ideological consequences of linguistic appropriation, which may allow whites to index a white positive identity, positive white identity, for example, as clever or cool or cosmopolitan, while covertly reproducing negative stereotypes of racialized communities, for example, as comical, lazy, or maybe dangerous. Important, importantly, Hill adamantly rejected what she called a personalist theory of racism, such as when racist, racist acts are defended on the basis of speakers has, having good intentions or having good hearts, or that racism is merely a matter of ignorance, personal ignorance. She objected to the personalizing of racism, not only because it misidentifies how racism functions in culture, but also because it leads to impossible debates as we attempt to discern the morality of individuals. To critical race theorists like Hill, personal dimensions such as individual intentions, beliefs, their knowledge and feelings have little to do with how race, racial hierarchies come to be reproduced through discourse. So since 2013, the concept of cultural appropriation has become to be debated widely in US public space, especially in mainstream um, and social media contexts. And this first table shows the number of mainstream news articles um, that uh, address the topic of cult cultural appropriation that were published in the United States, at least according to the university database that I have access to here. Um, and so we can see here, um, the on the left we see from 1995 and then in 2013 there was a gradual rise in the number of articles addressing the topic of cultural appropriation by 2016 it sort of peaked and then there was a general uh, diminishing of the number although it seems to be still 
um, a topic that's addressed in, in these newspaper articles. So similarly on Google, um, so Google has um, uh, a tool called Google Trends where you can see the relative popularity of certain search terms. And if you search cultural appropriation, you'll see that similar to the table that we saw before, um, the graph we saw before, around 2013, 2014, there was a gradual rise in the number of searches for the term cultural appropriation with a peak around 2016, 17, maybe 2018, um, and it still appears to be searched today. So while we can see that cultural appropriation came to be widely discussed about 18 years ago, I mean, sorry, not 18 years, around eight years ago in 2013, numbers alone offer limited qualitative insight on how people understand what appropriation actually is, or more specifically, why some people view it as morally problematic while others don't. To what extent do our everyday discourses about um, appropriation align with the way that scholars think about it? Um, scholars like Jane Hill as a, um, thinking of it as a racist practice. And why do, why do people in everyday spaces remain compelled to defend it? Um, if not in despite its apparent moral risk. Okay, so in order to look at this, the way in which the concept of cultural appropriation circulates in public space, I consider as well a video titled Seven Myths of Cultural Appropriation Debunked, as well as 500 of the nearly 10,000 comments that were posted in response to this particular video. Um, I treat both the video and the comments as evidence of commonly invoked discourses about appropriation in US public space. Um, the video was posted in November, 2015 by Francesca Ramsey, the black host of an MTV news web series called Decoded, which at the time primarily focused on issues of race. Um, if you look at the, it's still running. If you look today, her sort of repertoire of topics has broadened to, to issues of gender and sexuality and disability, um, but at the time she was primarily focused on issues of race. Uh, topics such as media representations, beauty standards and microaggressions. Um, note that the video was posted in 2015, which was just before the peak that we saw in the graphs um, in the previous slides. For those who may not al already be aware, Ramsey had become a recognizable figure on YouTube as the creator of a 2012 viral video meme called Shit White Girls Say to Black Girls, which parodies how white women frequently engage in well-intentioned racist language, which is sometimes labeled as microaggressions. So like popular disc discourse of appropriation, discussions of microaggressions have attempted to shift popular understandings of racism away from focusing on speaker intention and towards the cultural consequences of acts as commonly represented in the sort of popular alliterative, alliterative opposition it's about impact, not intention. So unlike her viral video meme, Ramsey's video on cultural appropriation draws on a kind of classic dialectical method of audience education, juxtaposing opposing perspectives on the issue. She first presents a well-intentioned defense of cultural borrowing, and after each defense, she critiques it illustrating the pitfalls of this well-intentioned logic. Repeating this sort of exchange seven times, she frames her video as inviting viewers who may disagree with her to be persuaded, while, offering, while also offering those who already agree with her to articulate critiques in their future conversations with others. In other words, her video is framed as a five minute mini lesson in anti-racist education belonging to a broader set of anti-racist genres in US public space. Perhaps from a cynical perspective, the video enacts a kind of corporate branding that in indexes MTV's modern institutional orientation to issues of diversity and inclusion, as we might see in many institutions today, mainstream institutions today. So I'll play a short segment um, to give you a sense of what the video looks like. 
And this is the opening of the video, near, very near the opening of the video. The more you learn about the world and the people in it, you quickly realize just how beautiful and diverse it is. So where's the line between cultural exchange, appreciation, and appropriation? And why does it even matter? Here are seven myths about cultural appropriation debunked. You're just looking for something to be offended by. It's just clothing, hairstyles, decorations, whatever. Don't you have something better to worry about? Okay, first off, it's possible to care about more than one issue at a time. The main problem with cultural appropriation comes from dominant groups borrowing from marginalized groups who face oppression or have been stigmatized for their cultural practices throughout history, like cornrows. I mean, anyone can wear their hair in cornrows, but Black people still face stigmas for wearing them, along with perfectly natural hairstyles like braids and locks. There are even companies and schools that prohibit these natural hairstyles. People have actually been fired for wearing braids. Meanwhile, fashion models and celebs like Kylie Jenner get praised for wearing cornrows. And that's the main point. One group is being penalized by institutions for wearing natural hairstyles, while the other is called edgy and stylish for doing the exact same thing. I'm doing it because I think it's beautiful and exotic. I Okay, I'll stop it there. But um, in the interest of time, but basically what happens is that she introduces the sort of um, those who don't accept the term appropriation or, or critical of the term appropriation and then her own sort of uh, explanation of why it doesn't, that argument doesn't hold water. And so this happens seven times throughout the video and it's a five minute video. So. Um, in considering, in addition to considering how Ramsey actually describes appropriation, it's equally important to consider um, how viewers actually responded to Ramsey's video, whether through votes of like or dislike or through the comments that they posted um, below her video. So what was, in other words, the uptake that uh, Ramsey's, what was the uptake of her video among her viewers? So. Very simply, we can sort of get a sense of the uptake based on the numerical votes of like and dislike uh, that viewers left in response to the video as a whole. And so YouTube suggests that the video was in fact disliked far more often than it was liked. So comments also left by viewers uh, convey stances towards the video as a way, and so as a way of sort of systematically looking at this, what I did was I counted every comment that had at least one like. And I counted, so I summed up um, the number of likes that were given um, and when they classified each of those comments in terms of whether it critiqued Ramsey, whether it supported Ramsey or whether it was ambiguous. And then I uh, totaled the number of likes for each of those either critiques or supports. And what, what we see here is that um, over the course, um, we can see that the number of likes for comments that were critical of Ramsey vastly outnumbered those that were supportive of her. Uh, so over the course of five years, it seemed that viewers in fact became increasingly critical of Ramsey's video. In the first year that the video was posted, 87%, see, um, 87% of nearly 3000 likes suggested disagreement with Ramsey, but by the most recent year, 99% of over 5,000 comments disagreed with her. So essentially most people sort of rejected the arguments that Ramsey was making in the video and it seemed to be increasingly so over time. I think there's an explanation for why the number might be um, greater uh, after the first year, but yeah, we can talk about that later. So um, among the kinds of arguments that, uh, presented by viewers in our comments. So I'll, I'll just present a few of the most common um, just to give you a sense of the uptake. They, when I classified them in terms of argument, there were something like 25 different kinds of arguments. Um, much of it's subjective in terms of how I'm, I'm uh, identifying what argument it's actually supporting. But just to give you a general sense of the kind of argument um, that was given, um, the most popular critique of Ramsey's video actually used a satirical formula of prohibiting, you know, sort of satirically prohibiting appropriation. For example, I'm an Indian, so no one can do yoga except Indians. Or I'm Greek, can you guys stop having democracy? It's kind of cultural appropriation. Or I'm Irish, nobody can wear green, it's our national color. So out of the 500 comments that I examined, that is 500 comments that each had at least one like, um, 59 of those 500 comments were of this particular form. Um, and in total, those of this form received um, over 7,000 likes, so 7,355 likes. 
So these were overwhelmingly popular, um, popular kinds of comments, satirical comments. 25% of the likes, 25% of the total number of likes were given to this, this sort of comment. So the second most common type of critique was a critique of Ramsey and her hypocrisy. For example, um, you know, at two minute, 15 seconds, ironic how she says how one person does not speak for the whole culture, yet she is doing, or she is speaking for the whole culture. And then also another critique, critiquing the hypocrisy of her name, Francesca, which um, viewers identify as an Italian name. So host name, Francesca, Italian name, and she's not visibly, you know, Italian to her audience. Um, and then finally, um, a third sort of common set of critiques was the, was the problematization of Ramsey's equivalence between race and culture. And so um, there were many comments of this kind that said, according to this entire argument, culture is determined only by race or African culture doesn't exist. I'm from Kenya and we have 47 different tribes. So in the interest of time, I won't go through any of the other arguments, but you can kind of get a sense of um, what sorts of things people were posting. So on the other side, those who supported the video, which was a very small minority, as I mentioned, um, these were, you know, these were the three most common types of arguments. Um, so first, there were those that agreed with Ramsey that yes, appropriation reflects a double standard. Um, and so one of the commenters says, I can so relate to this. I work with a Chinese doctor. One day I decide to wear my hair in a natural state, um, like wear an Afro. I, I had a headband with a bow. And at the end of the shift, she pulled me aside into her office and said that my hair was, quote, unruly and unmanageable and lazy. She told me that I would have to straighten out my hair. I pointed out to her that she wears her hair natural and the rest of our employees wear their natural hair. How come I can't wear mine? She just rolled her eyes at me, repeated the fact that I have to straighten out my hair. There are also those that simply praised Ramsey for, you know, sort of uh, presenting this educational video for being informative, I'll be honest, I didn't really understand what cultural appropriation was and how it showed itself in everyday life before the video, um, before watching this video, so thanks. And then finally, um, there were those who agreed with Ramsey that appropriation is a sign of disrespect towards people or cultures. So for in instance, I don't know, personally as someone who's Native American and sees a lot of cultural appropriation, I have to agree with every point in this video. It's not just a matter of uh, people of color not wanting to share their cu culture is just that my, um, just that more often than not, pieces of um, pieces of uh, people uh, people of color culture are being used disrespectfully or called calling it edgy or exotic. So, oh, just to uh, follow up, as I mentioned fewer than 2% of the likes went to comments that were in support. Okay, so in this section of my talk, I wanna, I wanna suggest that discourse of appropriation, whether supporting, uh, supporting critiques of appropriation or those who reject the concept of appropriation, presuppose an everyday theory of racist actions or a set of everyday assumptions about how cultural signs or linguistic signs gain their racist significance. In other words, they espouse an underlying account of what makes a symbolic act racist. In particular, I'll suggest that the semiotic theory encourages, um, semiotic theory of racism encourages people either to focus on the, the sign, the properties of the sign, for example, the word, particular words or phrases or the, you know, the form of the words and phrases and the meanings of the words and phrases, or on the properties of the sociocultural context. Um, I'll call the first orientation a sign-centered view and the second a context-centered view. Um, so in addition, what I'll show is that we often draw an important distinction between two scales of context. So on the one hand is the very local immediate scale with individuals involved, for example, in a speech event. Um, this is what might be called the narrow scale of the context. And then there's the wider scale or socio-historical scale at the context of groups. So this is both a, space, a, space, a scale of space and time, not just an individual, but groups as well as 
over broader a broader um, series of events over time. Okay. As I'll suggest, critical race theorists tend to orient to this broad scale of context, while everyday discourses, such as the ones that you heard, tend to orient to the narrow scale. So many everyday discussions of racism orient to properties of the local interactional context, the narrow context, which prioritizes aspects of individuals and their expectations in the immediate event. Under this view, we can distinguish between acts of appropriation from those that might be considered appreciation based on the individual's affective or epistemic state. And so taking this sort of narrow context-centered view, we might ask questions like, what kind of knowledge do individuals have about the symbols that they're using or, or borrowing? What kind of feelings do they have about the people from whom they're borrowing these symbols? What kind of relationship do they have with them? Have they been personally invited to engage in cultural borrowing? So these are some things we heard earlier, but these are the, the kinds of questions that get asked when we take this very narrow centered, narrow context centered view of racism. So as I noted earlier, a widely liked comment that was left in response to Ramsey's video expressed it this way. Um, and so here's the comment. Um, what I find the most frustrating about being accused of appropriation is that I understand that I understand the symbolism behind Bindi and Mendi, and I always exercise extreme care to wear them correctly. And so here they're emphasizing that they care and they, they're, they, they have the right kind of epistemic and effective stance to be able to borrow linguistic symbols without it being problematic in their view. Um, a similar commenter posted, one of my roommates was from the Ivory Coast and she and her African friends came over often to hang out. They invited me to experience a part of their culture and they spent many hours braiding my hair. I loved it. They were really happy about the way it turned out. I went to Walmart one day while my hair was in this African style box braids and a white lady at the checkout counter looked at me with judgment and she said, you're white, so you're not allowed to wear your hair that way. That's cultural appropriation. I actually have traveled to five different countries and used to live in the Middle East. So we see here again, the sort of um, her sort of rationalizing or suggesting that her acts are not problematic given that she was invited, um, uh, her affective stance is positive, etc. So interestingly, Ramsey even um, by the end of her video defends cultural participation as long as it comes from what she calls genuine love, respect and understanding. And as long as you're, a person is invited to participate, again, taking this narrow context centered view. So here is the clip where she says this. So you're saying I should never enjoy another culture? That's not fair. Not at all. For example, say you're invited to an Indian wedding and you're not Indian. Wearing a traditional sari or getting henna would be a great example of cultural exchange. You're being invited to participate and enjoy the culture instead of just picking and choosing parts of it for yourself. You can also travel, take cooking classes, read books listen to music and visit museums if you really want to learn about and enjoy other cultures. Here's the thing. Cultural appropriation is about a privileged group misrepresenting and disrespecting marginalized cultures. The originators rarely get credit, but always deal with the consequences. The goal isn't to shame you out of wearing or enjoying certain things, but listening to the people from the culture you're interested in shows you have a genuine love, respect, and understanding for something that's not your own. So in other words, when determining when an act is racist, both everyday critics and defenders of cultural borrowing appeal heavily to local contextual factors, including the knowledge, love, and respect that individuals have, as well as the personal permission they have to be, um, they have been granted to engage in borrowing. So as I noted earlier, Hill critiqued our focus on intentions, beliefs, and knowledge of speakers, not only because of how we are led down a sort of fruitless rabbit hole in our attempts to retrieve the interior beliefs and emotions of individuals, but also because focusing on this narrow scale leads us to ignore the ways in which racial hierarchies between groups have become repeatedly reproduced over longer scales of time. So, okay, so, so it's this critical race perspective that attends to this broader scale of socio-historical time 
as well as attending to the ways in which groups rather than individuals become located within racial hierarchies, whether through privileges of material profit afforded to whites or through representations of racialized groups that dehumanize or derogate. So in particular, relations of power between groups, for example, as racially privileged, as opposed to racially marginalized, figure centrally in discourses um, that take this wider contextual orientation. For Hill, a critical theory of racism is one that focuses primarily on this broad dimension of context that locates racial groups in relation to one another and understands racism as systemic, uh, whoop, as, oh, sorry, <laughs> as systemic or recurring in pattern ways across multiple events um, and structural or meaning embedded it within institutions and their norms. What makes language racist in her view is not the intentions or beliefs of speakers in a specific moment of discourse, but the repeated reproduction of racial hierarchies across many moments, creating enduring inequities between racial groups, both in terms of how they are imagined and how they're able to profit from their language use. So, Um, as we heard earlier, Ramsey actually does orient to this broad scale when she says the main problem with cultural appropriation comes from dominant groups borrowing from marginalized groups who face oppression or have been stigmatized for their cultural practices throughout history. And then later, there are even companies and schools that prohibit these natural hairstyles. People have actually been fired for wearing braids. Um, and then she says, and that's the main point. One group is being penalized by institutions for wearing natural hairstyles while the other is called edgy, stylish for doing the exact same thing. So she's attending here to sort of broader patterns of re the reproduction of racial hierarchies um, as practiced by institutions. So taking this broader scale. Um, so by the end of the video, she again repeats a characterization of racism that strongly aligns with both Smitherman and Hill's sort of critical race approach. As she says, the originators rarely get credit, but always deal with the consequences. So in other words, Ramsey does adopt um, a view of racism that is at least partially aligned with a critical race perspective. So I turn now to a final common orientation in discussions of appropriation, namely a focus on the properties of the ling linguistic sign such as the authenticity or the accuracy of its form and meaning, as well as the truth of its origins and ownership. So I refer to this as a sign-centered view of racism. For example, we might judge the racist value of language on the basis of its misrepresentation of racialized groups. So if it, the more it misrepresents, the more racist we may believe it to be, or its distortion of some original meaning, or its quote, Ill illegitimate use by speakers without proper ownership rights. Um, so in each of these cases, there seems to be some sort of violation of the authenticity of the sign in terms of um, its form, its meaning, um, its representation, as well as uh, who, who is allowed, who's permitted to use the sign. So Ramsey herself uh, expresses this sort of sign-centered perspective when she discusses um, tribal tattoos as used by a fashion designer. Take for example, tribal tattoos. The Maori of New Zealand has facial tattoos with deep family meaning and cultural significance. But fashion designer Jean-Paul Gaultier used the tattoos in ads to sell sunglasses. And that's a perfect example of cultural appropriation. No matter how much the designer liked the look, he stripped the tattoo of all of its cultural meaning just to sell a product. And then a little, a bit later in the video, she has a similar sort of critique um, of the inaccuracy of the sign as being sort of the reason, the grounds for thinking that this is a problematic practice. A couple of years ago, Katy Perry did a geisha themed performance with Japanese women dancing in the background. Not only was it super stereotypical, her outfit wasn't even from the right country. So it's done incorrectly and therefore racist. So Hill herself grappled with whether she should take a sign-centered approach in her own work. Of course, one of the points she makes in part of her work is that when we focus on things, on what she calls the baptismal or the referential status 
of words. For example, debating um, what the true origins of a word are, whether it's really a slur, or, or when debating whether words truthfully represent the world or, or untruthfully do so, and using that as a basis for determining whether something's racist or not. She argues that such debates about the truth of words, much like personal dis personalist discourses, distract us from understanding how racist hierarchies are maintained through language. So she's, um, at least in part of her work, she does reject this idea that we should focus on the sign as um, the authenticity of the sign. At the same time, her identification of specific forms as mock language and her critique of how mock language distorts linguistic forms, if you recall, she critiques sort of the hybridization, anglicized hybridization and semantic, what she called semantic pejoration um, of words. She arguably adopts a sign-centered perspective by highlighting the mockness or inauthenticity of language she suggests a problematic departure from authentic forms and meanings. For, for Hill, appropriate language is racist, at least in part by virtue of its phonologically and semantically butchered character. So in fact, we should note that the very concept of appropriation prioritizes the question of what the authentic status of a sign is, namely its status as originating certain groups yet being inauthentically used by other groups. The presupposition of an authentic sign, uh, an authentic origin, thus sometimes makes it awkward to characterize things like mock Spanish forms like El Chipo or mock Asian forms like Ching Chong to be appropriations, given that they're not actually originating in some racialized community, but rather are the sort of representation um, from a perspective, from, from a um, privileged privilege white gaze perspective. Okay. Take for example. Okay, so I'll close now with some brief thoughts about the possibilities of the concept of appropriation as an anti-racist tool in both scholarly and everyday discourses. As I've discussed, some parallels do exist between linguist assumptions about appropriation and, and assumptions present in everyday discourses. For example, both have acknowledged the ways in which appropriation maintains hierarchies between racialized groups uh, on a broad scale, whether because of asymmetries of profit or negative stereotypes, um, racializing stereotypes. Yet popular discourses about appropriation tend to prioritize two dimensions that scholars have sometimes downplayed. The first is the authenticity of the sign, um, such as whether a word has its true original form or whether it's being used by its original owners. Um, and I suggest that the very concept of appropriation presupposes a sign-centered view of racism that may limit our understanding of what makes certain kinds of language borrowings racist. Second, uh, everyday discourses tend to focus on narrow contextual factors, such as the intentions and beliefs of borrowers, the interpersonal relations between interlocutors, and even, uh, as although I didn't discuss it here, the offense taken by listeners as sort of central to determining whether something's racist. Critical race theorists, on the other hand, have tended to shift their focus away from these narrow properties of individuals and individual events, focusing instead on the structural and systemic nature of racist processes across numerous events. Despite its limitations, can a concept like appropriation bring attention, at least, to the ways in which racial hierarchies are reproduced in everyday life? On the one hand, perhaps, the overwhelmingly negative responses towards Ramsey's video cast doubt on this possibility. If you recall about something like 99% of the vote like votes were given to comments that rejected Ramsey's video. On the other hand, perhaps the numerous comments left in response offer some hope that people are at least willing to engage in some sort of discourse about the topic. Admittedly, it's not clear whether we can call Ramsey's single video productive or unproductive in inviting the public towards a critical view of racism. What seems to be clear, however, is that the uptake of scholarly concepts in everyday life always takes place in the con context of multiple cultural projects. While some of these projects are anti-racist, uh, or at least framed as such, other projects involve, for example, justifications of one owns own acts of cultural borrowing or rationalizations of our discomfort with seeing incongruent racialized signs or sometimes participation in the corporate in corporate branding 
in order to index an institution's modern or inclusive character. These projects may constrain the uptake of academic concepts in some ways while propelling it in others. If we understand that anti-racist discourse always takes part in these simultaneous, simultaneous cultural projects, perhaps we don't need to hold these discourses to perfectly articulating how racism works. They just need to propel our discourses in the right direction. A controversial and compelling concept like appropriation, limited as it may be in some respects, may continue to nudge us along productive paths in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Elaine. That was a really uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, Abby, are you running the questions or how is that going to work? Yes. So if you have a question, um, you can either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat if you don't want to ask it yourself, whichever works best for you. Um, while we're waiting for people to put their questions in, I do have a quick sort of logical question. Um, did you go through each comment individually and look at the likes and then decide from that which ones you were going to analyze, basically just going through the thing based on the most number? Yeah, I just went. So there were about 10, almost 10,000 comments. So what I did was each of the ones that had at least one like, I looked at individually. So there were fi about 500 of those. So I did look individually at 500 yeah. of them and then classified them in terms of whether they supported or critiqued and what sort of argument that they were off and they were offering in their support or critique of, of Ramsey. That seems like a lot of work. So um, yeah. it was very much appreciated. Um, Dr. Baker has a question first. Okay. I was kind of holding back in case a student wanted to ask the first question. But uh, Elaine, this was amazing. Thank you. I mean, we all grapple, at least in my teaching, with this appropriation, because cultural appropriation by itself is fine. We, our world would be toast if we didn't have diffusion, exchange, and the, as we know, culture is learned behavior and copying and appropriating. I mean, there's such fine lines, but having this notion of sort of um, broad and narrow contexts and using the sign and level it, layering it with um, sort of the anti-racism and critical race theory enables us, I think, to look at the difference between Elvis Presley appropriating Ma Rainey for a lot of cash um, and you know our African American students going over to Ghana, buying their dashikis, and to, you know I mean us African Americans have appropriated a lot of African culture, but we think it's ours, but it really isn't, and all this sort of stuff. And there's sort of levels of power and desertion right. as well. I mean it's so crazy because then when you start looking at the gender thing, there's a lot of cisgender men that are wearing two. Um, earrings and painting their fingernails just as a kind of to be edgy. Is that a problem? It could be a problem, but not really because they're pushing back against gendered norms and the like. But you just gave us a, 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 a way and a toolkit to sort of say, that's racist. And yeah, maybe that is just edgy. I don't know. It, it was a, it, for me, I mean, as a, I teach cultural anthropology and, you know, I support cultural appropriation and exchange and everything. But there's limits to it and you gave me some tools to really be able to discern you know how racism works and how it's such a scavenger ideology that the same process could be really positive in one context and fundamentally supporting white supremacy in the other and that's hard for students to really oftentimes tease through because as those comments said yeah on the surface yeah democracy is appropriating greek culture sure that's a good argument but to be able to sift through and and, and, and use analytical frameworks to discern this is super helpful. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so my question, I'll let Kathy, I'll come back with the question. <laughs> Mine is more just, um, again, I really appreciate the talk. It was so interesting. And um, I'm gonna date myself, like over 20 years ago, I went to the Bahamas on spring break and I got my hair braided and I paid for it. The lady 
it, it was going, there were several of them going all around the beach and we were all white girls and they were just, you know, you paid them to braid your hair and I, I loved it um, and never thought twice about it until after the fact and I see pictures and I cringe like, oh, I just, you know, I was appropriating, but, but like you said, you know, I, I paid for it. So in some ways there was a transaction. It's just really complex, I think. Um, and I just, I, I, I enjoyed your talk. Oh, thank you. That's all I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is complicated. I mean, as you see from the comments, um, it, often the person who's engaging in the cultural borrowing, I mean, they often don't think that they're appropriating or, and, and I'm not, and I'm actually not taking a strong stand about whether we should call it appropriation or not. Um, because I think in some sense, it's this um, appropriation itself is a social construct and it's a tool that we can use to help make people aware of inequities um, and not necessarily that it actually describes um, real, uh, you know, actual, actual, you know, the way that things really are. Um, sh should I be calling on people with their hands up or, oh no, okay. I can do it or you can do it, whatever you feel more. Oh, oh please, I'll, yeah, I'll let you do it. <laughs> um, so we will do Carlos and then Dr. Andrews. Hi, I just wanted to echo what everyone else was saying. I thought it was a really great talk. And as someone who's not really a linguistics major or studies this sort of stuff, it, um, I really appreciated how easy it was for me to follow through. But um, my question was uh, more so, I guess, on how you've seen cultural appropriation within other groups of color. I'm not sure if you were referencing your own study or if that was just someone else who happened to name, be named Chun uh, when you were mentioning Asian American youth appropriating African American English. But um, I, I was just wondering, I guess, what the differences are when it's another group of color appropriating and how, um, how I guess we can kind of um, move away from that uh, in order to support like coalition building because oftentimes you'll see, you know, groups of color living in the same communities, uh, especially black and brown, um, black and different black and brown people. So I, I was wondering how you could see, you know, participation within each other's culture without appropriating it like we sometimes do, uh, you know, with certain phrases and, and other stuff like that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, that, that, was, that was my work on a, a Korean Americans appropriating African American vernacular English. And what's interesting in that particular study that, that I did, it was really, it was just sort of an analysis of a few excerpts where a group of Korean American friends were using what I identified at the time as African American English um, appropriations of it. And interestingly, they actually aligned, they felt um, one of the, one of the um, men who was engaging in it actually felt a strong alignment with black culture. And that was part of, um, I think his expression of alignment, but it, it could at the same time be understood as a kind of appropriation. Um, what I ended up arguing in that paper is that um, what's problematic about that practice is not necessarily that it's taking something from somebody that, you know, uh, taking something from a community that it isn't their own, but rather the way in which they um, performed it reproduced certain stereotypes about Black masculinity. And so that's where the problem lies, I think, for a lot of these practices. The simplified sort of um, borrowings end up reproducing these stereotypes. Um, so, you know, whether we can actually call it appropriation or not, I, I don't know <laughs> if there is a clear answer to that. Um, but that's a really good question. And um, yes, yeah, solidarity building is a good thing. And, and perhaps um, I think there are local contexts in which what outsiders might view as appropriation actually is not viewed as such within, within that particular setting. Yeah. Ed? You're muted. I appreciate uh, the clarity of your discussion on intention, which is irrelevant. Uh, I, I mean, the, the way you uh, explain that you, that's not a good argument. And, and this is something that I think speech act theory, linguistics has, has, has 
moved on from this uh, a long time ago. And, you know, and I think that models of, of you know, from the Jacobsonian model on of speech acts as negotiations that are played out and, and speaker intention is one of many things that is uh, plays a role in the emergent meanings, but they're negotiated. It doesn't matter what the speaker thinks. It doesn't matter what the speaker wants. In fact, the, the speaker may have a very um, clear purpose and they may be outvoted. So, so I think this is a really important moment uh, to make the point again that speaker intention is not what is driving speech act. And, and, and it's a negotiation in the speech communities and communities of practice. Mm -hmm. Having said that, I, I, I think uh, you mentioned this, but I'd love to hear how you uh, would frame the heterogeneity within and across speech communities. Um, with respect to intention or just- Well, no, attention, oh, okay. we, we, you've gotten rid of intention and I'm there with you. But now that we are looking at actual uh, dynamic emergent meanings in speech acts, they're always embedded in these very heterogeneic and plural speech communities, right? Even within a language, let's, but since the world is mainly multilingual, we have to take that into account as well. But we're members of multiple and changing speech communities. And those speech communities are heterogeneic in and of themselves, right? Mm -hmm. So how would you see bringing sort of those bigger notions of speech communities into this conversation? That, that's my question. Yeah, it's a big question. Um, one comment I wanna make about intention I, uh, is that although um, I'm suggesting that it's not necessarily productive of focus on intention, intention actually does matter greatly in um, at least in American culture. People think that intention matters and to the extent Extent that they think it matters. It's part of our ideologies um, about racism. Um, it's not necessarily what critical race theorists think makes something racist, but it's something that we as everyday people, participants of this culture believe is relevant when we assess something as racist or not. Um, but um, so in terms of the, yeah, I, I may have to think, think through your question about the heterogeneity of speech communities um, are, and do, so are you referring to sort of um, heterogene, heterogeneous in terms of linguistic practices? And so, you know, they're sort of... Well, so, I mean, in, in Heim's uh, original conception, uh, you know, it, the abstraction is the rules and interpretation of at least, of at least one variety, right? Mm -hmm. So by definition, it's not one variety. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and and it does imply some sort of mutual uh, uh, outcomes, which are negotiated. But since none of us are only members of one speech community, yeah. um, I'm just wondering how you uh, can uh, deepen the uh, discussion of of how you negotiate those additional um, and, and those additional boundaries in the broader context as opposed to the narrower context. I mean, I think that the broader, uh, the broad, what you call the broad context uh, that uh, is more historical, I think that that's got to be there because I think speech acts by definition are not just in the moment. Mm -hmm. They also have histories, right? Mm, okay. Th that's what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um... I was thinking, I mean, in some sense, if we recognize that communities are extremely heterogeneous, notions like appropriation become, <laughs> just don't work because the notion of appropriation depends on us identifying clear boundaries and, and languages, language that belong within particular communities. And in reality, as linguists, we all know that that's not the way that language works. It's, it's much messier than that. Um, uh, but, but I still think you're, you're, you're on to something because I do think that there are, while we are members of heterogeneous multiple communities, we are not members of all of them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But, you know, I think this for me, uh, and this was part of our class day, I, I'm so concerned about essentialism raising its head uh, 
when, you know, when I think of, the, I'm deeply the convert of uh, identity and the emerging identities of situated social interactions, what you do, you're not an R, you're a do. And how we bring these together into a higher uh, and more profound uh, theoretical approach, but also a pragmatic one. So I think it's really, what you've done is really important. I'm just throwing out some, you know, larger context. Yeah, thank you, thank you. It, it will give me some things to think about, yeah. Um, we will do Dr. Braun and then finish with Dr. Baker again. Hi, Elaine. Um, <laughs> this was a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you won't lose me because I'm sort of in the field, as you can see, um, for various reasons. But in any case, um, my question actually kind of interestingly built on what Carlos was asking about uh, in terms of uh, different groups that are not white uh, within, let's say, you know, American society borrowing from each other. In particular, I'm thinking about your earlier work, uh, right? In your earlier work, um, when you're talking about, and I remember that article with the boys, with the Korean boys, and they're very much like, at least one of them, I believe, is very much identifying as like anti-white. And mm -hmm. that's how he's trying to underscore like his, that, that position, position himself in that way is by using these um, very, however slangy and stereotypical like AV phrases mm -hmm. um, and uh, as it happens just yesterday in my class um, a um, this issue came up I was um, mentioning Eddie Huang's Fresh of the Boat mm -hmm. the book itself right so I'm not talking about the sitcom which is a whole other thing but the, the book and you know he so we have this kind of interplay there between like different the systemic issues of hierarchies among different uh, racial, racial, racialized groups within American society, but then also kind of like individual construction of identity. And, mm -hmm. in, and he very much tries to position himself, right, as like a, um, again, in the same way, not white, very much anti kind of, you know, uh, trying to find his own, I guess, identity. And he adopts a whole range of African American cultural resources, uh, whether it's like his, you know, uh, his his love of hip hop and basketball, but also he uses a lot of AVE. Um, but it's not just slang. He actually has all these fairly, like if you look at his book, uh, complex, you know, syntactic uses that um, at least appear to be, you know, beyond go beyond the the simplistic just borrowing of a phrase or a you know a phonetic kind of adaptation here or there, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so and he's very aware of it, and he talks about it a lot. I have to perform this blackness because I'm not white, but I'm Asian, and we are kind of lost in this binary racial picture of America. Like it's kind of what he's saying. Are you? Can you still hear me? Okay. Um, but then again, he gets a lot of pushback. So this came up in my class yesterday, as uh, someone pointed out that the, he got a lot of pushback from uh, the African American community for his cultural appropriation, and in fact, a lot of anti blackness in his own stances. And so, and then he takes this intentional perspective, like, that's not how I mean it. I grew up in Queens, I'm allowed to do this, you know, so I was just wondering if you had thoughts on on those uh, kinds of, I don't know how familiar you are with that particular book, but if you had any thoughts on those yeah. kind of interplays. I haven't, I haven't read the book, but I am familiar with him. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like different kinds of context are being invoked in order to sort of justify or critique his practices. And he, of course, as being himself his whole life, has his own access to the particular context in which he's been a part of. Um, and, but those who don't know him, um, probably think about different kinds of contexts, maybe more socio-historical contexts that are not directly relevant to him. But it, yeah, it is interesting. I mean, um, I was trying to think about, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about the, just the general sort of discussions that people have when trying to 
and we, we work so hard to try to figure out, is it bad or not? Is it, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? Is he doing something that's yeah. problematic or not? Um, and the kinds of rationalizations we, we provide in order to um, figure that out. Um, I mean, you know, I, I've asked myself, like, what questions should we be asking when we assess something? Right. And, I, and I think my, for now, at least my tentative answer is that we should think about whether it participates in sort of um, broader processes that, that reproduce hierarchies, not just that one individual instance, you know, we can't judge it by itself, but in, in terms of how it connects to other right. kinds of practices that have been going on. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. Back to Dr. Baker, and then we are done with questions. Okay, thank you. Um, I was, what your talk also forced me to think about is why appropriation is so pernicious and people feel it so emotionally. And I think part of the piece is that the sort of the, um, the obverse of appropriation, which is the forced um, conformation, the assimilation, the respectability, that in order for you to be successful, you have to appropriate this white, middle-class, American, whatever you want to call it, hegemonic culture, and then code switch to be more familiar. And then it's that forcing for that to, to conform to something that is not yours and then you get punished if you don't. Can you speak a little bit more about the other side of this where that's the sort of the mere opposite of appropriation is being forced to conform to something that isn't yours and how that then folk uh, makes appropriation even more pernicious yes. or emotional maybe. Th those two concepts of assimilation versus I'm sorry, yeah, assimilation versus appropriation, that those two things mm -hmm. are often opposed. And I, I do agree that part of why appropriation is um, such a, um, uh, something that people object to so strongly has to do with the asymmetries that often um, people of color who are in, in um, less privileged positions, you know, they must conform, they're forced to conform um, and are penalized, as you exactly said, they're penalized if they don't. Um, whereas, um, uh, whereas there, I guess, um, from, from a white perspective, um, there, there is no pressure to be, to adopt, there's no pressure to adopt, um, resources from communities of color. Um, and in fact, they profit in ways that, um, people of color do not. I'm sorry, I'm talking around the issue. I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. No, that's exactly what I want. I just think that when, when we're talking about appropriation, that's a critical component at the same time. Yes, yes. The conformation. But thank you so much. You were awesome. Uh, thanks for <laughs> joining us here at Duke. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. This is, yeah, it's a lot of fun to get to present this. Yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you.